Hello, everyone. Welcome to MLOps Production and Engineering New York City. My name is Nadia, and I'm a senior machine learning engineer at NIDAS. Today, I'm honored to be here and to have the opportunity to introduce one of our amazing speakers. Before starting, I would like to remind you that you can visit our sponsor booths for a chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card or $200 Starbucks gift card. Just click on the Expo tab and choose the sponsor. The last thing, if you have a question, please post it in the chat. I will collect all the questions and ask them directly to our speaker after the presentation. So let's start. Our speaker is Mike Oakman. Mike is a machine learning engineer in Google Cloud where he helps customers designing, implementing, and deploy end-to-end -end machine learning models. He also teaches the ML Immersion Program in Google Advanced Solution Lab. Please join me in welcoming Mike Mann. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Nadia. Thanks so much for the introduction, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to come here and speak, and thanks, everyone, for, for jumping in to join. Um, as Nadia said, uh, I'm an ML engineer in Google Cloud, and what we're talking about today are some machine learning design patterns. Um, please, if you have any questions, make a note and we'll, we'll talk about them. Uh, we'll address them at the, end, at the end of the talk. I'll save some time at the end. So with people who are familiar with uh, like software development typically, or you know, the idea of a design pattern shows up quite a lot there. And in fact, in other, other areas as well. Um, and so you think about a design pattern, it's just like a formalized best practice to solve common problems that, that arise. And so the idea uh, of machine learning design patterns is exactly that. You know, in my role as an ML engineer in cloud, I work a lot with customers and we're building and deploying models with them. Um, and so we've seen a lot of use, I've seen, I've seen a lot of problems sort of come up along the years. And the idea of the book was then just to sort of compile uh, a lot of those same design patterns. So, so likely if you've been working in machine learning or you're familiar with ML ops in general, um, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize a lot of the patterns that we discuss in the book. And most of the time we're just giving it a name. Um, and, uh, and ideally it may even like spark some ideas for solutions for problems that you come across that maybe you hadn't thought of or hadn't seen in the past. Just really quickly, I'll give it an idea about like what, what's, you know, what, what all kind of patterns we look at. And, you know, a lot of the patterns that we discuss in the book are sort of broken down in different parts of the ML life cycle. Maybe it involves like data representation or how you're representing your problem or problems related to the actual like training loop of machine learning or resiliency or reproducibility and responsible AI. And there's a map uh, in the book where you can sort of see how all the different patterns are of course related to each other and where they fit in that schema. And I will say like the, the format in the book also is that for each design pattern, we, we sort of phrase each pattern in a similar way. Where we first talk about the problem, like where you might come across this kind of pattern or might, why you might want to be aware of this and discuss it in the context of a solution, like where, what, what you might actually do to solve that problem. Uh, we discuss why it works, and then we discuss like trade-offs and alternatives. And that's what we're going to see today. So I'm going to talk about two, two design patterns to some detail um, that I think are important to be aware of. And you'll see that, that similar breakdown. Also, the code is available on GitHub. And if you go, if you look for the ML design patterns GitHub page, you know, each of the design patterns, we have some code that really is just a way of like showing this implementation of how you actually put that into practice or put it into code. So the goal for today's talk really is just to do a little bit of a deep dive into two of those design patterns. Uh, we're going to talk about continuous model evaluation um, or like model, model, model monitoring and also explainable predictions. Um, I'm going to go into both of those in some detail. And like I said before, I'll leave some time at the end in case you have any questions. Uh, we can talk more about the details of those. So I'll start with continuous model evaluation. So, the pattern of the continuous model evaluation, it falls in the later stages of this ML life cycle. So it's like after your model has been deployed. And you know, this is an ML ops conference, and I'm sure all of you are, are, are painfully or pleasantly aware of the importance of this aspect or ML ops in general and, the, and how make, it makes deploying models much more complicated, right? Um, so typically there's a lot of work that goes into just building the model. Like you have to clean the data, you train the model, there's a lot of development, and even getting the model into deployment can be a lot of work and to, get, to get it to be used. Uh, but the work doesn't stop there. Like, you know, it's never a one and done, right? And so um, once the model's deployed, you really want to be able to track the progress uh, and track the performance of your model over time. And this is important because, you know, your models have become less performant for many reasons. Two of the main reasons or two common reasons are uh, concept drift and data drift. 
So to say a little bit more about those, in concept drift, the underlying assumptions of your model have changed. So this is really common, a problem that occurs when your model uh, is trying to learn adversary or competitive behavior, something like a fraud detection model or like spam filters or things like that. And the reason, the reason is clear, right? Because you have, you have an adversarial behavior. So you know, you, you, you've trained your data on in one scenario and sort of like the adversaries have learned to evade that scenario. And so your training data um, in, inherently will change its, change its characteristics. So a good example to nail it down a little bit more is you can think about a model developed to detect credit card fraud. You know, that model that was developed before people were using chip and pin technology changed a lot, right? Once chip and pin technology was introduced, a lot of credit card fraud then moved online. And just the types and the characteristics and the features that you would be using to determine what an instance of credit card fraud would have changed just from that one instance. Um, another example of concept drift is in text. And you know, the way we use words changes over time. Um, and the meanings of the words like troll and sell and cloud, they've evolved to have a digital meaning. So like a troll doesn't necessarily live under a bridge, it could be behind a computer. Um, a cell can refer to like a jail cell, but more likely now it refers to a mobile phone. And a cloud, you know, it's like in the sky, but now when people talk about cloud, especially with a bias audience like this, you're thinking more of like a data center in Iowa or something like that. Um, and then there's data drift. So data drift refers to any, any change that has occurred in the data that's being fed to your model. And this can happen in like te for technical reasons, like maybe in some upstream um, data pre-processing pipeline, uh, the input schema, the data schemas have changed, or a field has been um, added or deleted uh, you know, this is a change in the actual data that's being fed to your model. And if you don't account for like how to, 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 to correct that, then your model is going to suffer, right? Um, maybe more subtly are things like the feature distributions can change. Like the actual, you know, you know, the actual feature distributions can change over time. So, you know, for example, you could have um, a model deployed in a hospital. It might start to see younger and younger adults because the ski resort was opened up nearby. And just that change in the demographic of your uh, population can cause your model to suffer. So the long and short of it is model deployment is a continuous process and it may be necessary to retrain. And so the question here is like, well then how do you know when and if you need to retrain? Um, and continuous model evaluation is one way you can go about doing that. So, so how do you do it? Um, so the way you can address this is you need to be able to compare your model predictions with the ground truth. Um, you're sort of taking that development environment that you were doing um, in some like sterile like, you know, model development process and then move that into the wild, into the world where your model is actually being used. So one example that we can, we can look at to see what this actually looks like is suppose we've trained a, classification, a text classification model on articles, article titles, determining whether they come from uh, the New York Times, TechCrunch, or GitHub. So if the title of the article is something like the Supreme Court to hear a major course in partisan districts, you know, you would hope that your model will then be able to classify that article as coming from the New York Times because, because it did. So suppose we train this test classification model, um, you know, do, some, do, do the extra work to get your model into production and you can serve uh, predictions via a REST API. So, you know, you give me text and my model will be able to spit back uh, the classification for that text. So the idea, like I said before, is you want to have some way that you can capture those predictions and also be able to compare with ground truth. And it's something that makes a lot of sense, but it can be easier said than done. So one way you can do this, and again, like I'll talk about the technology that, that sort of I use, I've used when I'm doing this, which is uh, BigQuery and Google Cloud, but there's of course many other, other similar frameworks you could use. But the general idea remains the same. You want to be able to capture relevant information. And the relevant information could depend a lot on your use case, but here what we'll talk about is like capturing the model name, the model version, the date the request was sent, the actual text request for the article title. Um, and then you also want to be able to capture the model's predictions, where it's a, it's a multi-class classification model here. So we'll capture the model's confidence for the prediction, um, and then also the model's return prediction. Like in this case, whatever source it would be, we'll say the New York Times. Um, and then, of course, ultimately, what we want to be able to do is then go back into that table where we're storing this, these, these predictions as they come to our model. And we need to be able to provide the ground truth. And this can be done in different ways, but probably the best way is to use the gold standard of having humans provide that ground truth through some labeling service or, um, or just doing it yourself. So you can keep track, so you can be able to map what your model predicted and what the actual ground truth was. 
So the value of this then is probably clear, but um, you know, setting that up is, is usually the hardest part. And there's obviously, there's some services that can make that job easier for you. Typically what you're gonna be doing is just as a request comes in, take that request, goes to your model to serve your predictions in that pipeline you have developed already. And also you're just saving those predictions. Um, and you're saving the, 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 the requests and the predictions um, and those different fields that I mentioned before. And the value is that you know, by capturing the date time, you're then able to be able to track your model's performance over time. So once you have the, the source and the, the, sorry, the prediction and the ground truth, you can see how your model's performance you know, improves or degrades or you know, changes over time. And so really that's the advantage of something like continuous model evaluation. It provides a framework to evaluate the performance on exclusively new data. Like you, you, know, you would have done this in your development practice using your test set, for example, and you have a certain confidence your model is up to, up to you know, you know, at performance levels. Um, but you want to be able to keep that monitoring going uh, once the model is deployed. Um, and this gives you a way to quantifiably track, track model performance and measure how different model versions perform with A-B testing. So for example, you know, we said we captured the model version. You know, if you do say, okay, we've noticed a, a degree, our model performance is degrading, we can take in that newer data, we can retrain our model either by fine tuning or you know, if we feel like it might be necessary going back and looking back over our, our entire model development process and we can create a new version of that model. And then again, because we set up our uh, continuous evaluation procedure to capture the model version, we have a very easy way now of, the, of doing A-B testing to say, okay, look, as new requests come in, we can really compare how is our version one comparing to our version two. Um, some of the trade-offs or alternative you know, things you wanna keep in mind is that it can sometimes take some time to get those ground truth labels. And honestly, that, that usually is the more difficult aspect. You have, depending on how often your model is, is being used and how many requests you're getting, Going back and filling in those, those ground truths can, can be, can be, um, can be time-consuming. And also, there's a time component, right? Like, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to build a model, like a churn model, you may not actually know how many subscriptions uh, in the next cycle have been discontinued until after that next subscription cycle. Or if you're building a model to predict, like, next quarter's revenue, you don't actually know what next quarter's revenue was until, you know, for a few months yet. And so, you know, it may take some, some time before you can actually go back and apply those ground truths to any of the received requests that you've got for your model. Um, but with that in place, there's also ways you can set up triggers for retraining. You need things like cloud functions, AWS Lambda functions, or Azure functions. And these provide a serverless way to automate retraining via triggers. So as your model starts to degrade, and if it goes below some threshold, you can say, okay, now what we want to do is retrain and deploy our model, set it as a new version, and then have someone go back in and inspect and see, like, does this, does this retraining actually help? Do we want to swap out which model we're using for our predictions? Of course, the natural question that we always come up with is like, okay, well, then what do you want that, that, that threshold to be? And the pictures I've drawn here just give you an idea, but of course it never ever really is that, is that simple, uh, but it's a trade-off, like most things in machine learning or anywhere. You know, if you set your threshold too low, you're sort of, you're not retraining as much, uh, but you're also compromising perhaps like the quality of your, of your predictions. If you set your threshold too high, you're probably just retraining too much and you need to be able to, you know, that could have additional costs and extra development time. Um, and as far as alternatives are concerned, you know, one thing you can do is mimic the continued model evaluation situation in an offline environment. So, you know, what you can do is you can train your, your, your model on old data, like you, you know, you're, you're developing at time T, go back six months and pretend that what happened six months ago was all the data that you had. You build your model, you train your model, um, and then what you do is you can evaluate your model on current data. Um, it's a way, like a cheap way of, um, if you don't have, if you, you know, to save your, you know, save development time of setting up that entire continuous evaluation framework, that you can just test and get an idea most importantly here for how often do you think you might need to retrain? So here I said six months, but again, like with what you know of your data and what you, what you what, of your use case, maybe you have reason to believe it could be a year or three months or something. Uh, but this kind of like offline testing can give you an idea of how often you think your model might be going uh, stale. And so you can keep that in mind. So you down the road. Okay. So uh, we're going to change gears a bit. Uh, but next, we're going to get into explainable predictions. So again, um, this is another uh, pattern that we discussed in the book. 
explainability in machine learning, I, I find, or in, in AI, has become more and more of an increasing topic. And, and, and as we're deploying models and productionizing models with customers that we work with, uh, being able to explain those predictions and being able to understand why the model is predicting what it's predicting, it seems to be a constant conversation nowadays. And, uh, and, 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 and it's a more core part of, of productionization in, in machine learning. And you know, it's part of a much broader conversation that's typically commonly referred to as responsible AI. So when people talk about responsible AI, they're talking about uh, things like ML fairness, explainability, privacy, security, ethical AI. Um, and this is all just ways of ensuring that AI benefits society and doesn't reinforce any unfair bias that shows up uh, that potentially will show up when training models. So explainability itself can, can be used to, you know, use to mean many things. Um, you can think of explainability in the context like humans in the loop or human computer interaction, uh, maybe on the more uh, procedural or regular, regulatory side is like aud auditability or traceability um, and there's accountability. Also, it's just transparency for users to understand why a model is making its predictions. Uh, you know, explainability can mean a lot of things. Um, we think of explainability or I think of explainability as a process of understanding and communicating how or why an ML model makes the certain predictions uh, that it does. And so when I talk about explainability, we're really just focusing on that aspect. Like why does the model, explaining why a model makes the predictions it does and enable human to understand those specific results. You know, I'm sure people have had experience working with really complex models and the more complex your model gets, though it may have more capacity and more ability to solve difficult problems, it oftentimes often comes at the expense of being able to explain why your model is making the predictions that it is. So it sort of comes at the expense of explainability. But it's really important. So again, like in my role, I work a lot with customers and I, you know, I'm de developing models. And I find that it's a really useful tool uh, in every aspect of that ML workflow, right? So from the engineer's perspective, it gives us a way of increasing the understanding of like why our model is making the predictions that it does. It helps you to create better algorithms to understand you know, like where it's failing, why it's failing. But then also, because I interact a lot with customers and I'm working with different people in the organizations on that side, you can see the importance of explainability for customers, for the, for the consumers of the model and the regulators. And this can mean the people who are actually using your model predictions, um, and but also the, regulation, the regulators on the business side, they need to ensure that their models aren't biased and they have full transparency of why the model is making its predictions. You know, there's lots of good studies out there and there's a lot you can say about explainability. Um, but you know, a, a good example that, I, that you can see is like, you know, say you're training some, some model to process images of chest x-rays. You know, and you, you wanna be able to understand why your model's making its predictions. And, and here, say you get some label, you know, you can detect why, like what were the pixels that were most influencing your model's prediction for that reason. And then here you can see that actually, this model was making its predictions based on these pin marks that were accidentally left by by the physician, which then from the engineer's perspective, I can say, okay, let's go back, let's scrub our images and really make sure that the data that we're feeding to our model is clean and correct. Um, but even more importantly, from the consumer's perspective, and this has been studied in these papers where, you know, just providing the model's predictions isn't nearly as helpful as providing the model's predictions and the why. Like a heat map on an image like this to be able to say, here's what the model is saying, here's why it's saying that way, really empowers, for example, a doctor to be able to make the best choice for their patients. So in terms of explainability, there's lots of tools. And it's always curious to me to have where this lands with people in the audience, because some people have done a lot of explainability, some have done none, some are just curious. And so down below, you probably see a lot of different uh, explainability techniques that maybe you've worked with yourself. But this is just a very rough rubric of uh, a taxonomy of different explainability methods. And I find it really helpful, like when you're learning about explainability or when you're wanting to implement a procedure yourself to understand like, basically like where they all fit, like where do these different uh, techniques fit in the grander scheme of each other. Um, and so the first split that we have when you're talking about how to, how to explain a model is you can approach it from an intrinsic or a post hoc way. And this just means, uh, you know, intrinsic explainability means that you're restricting your model complexity to machine learning models that are intrinsically explainable. Think of things like short decision trees or sparse linear models. And there's also the post hoc approach where, okay, you've trained your model and it may be more of like a black box model, but you want to be able to look back at it and say, okay, we've trained the model, uh, you know, how do the different features, you know, cause a certain prediction or what are the important aspects of the, of the features that I trained? 
And then when you're looking back at your model's predictions, you can look at this in a local way or a global way. So local in this case just means for that one prediction. So this is looking at contributions of input variables for a single data point that your model made a prediction on. Um, these tend to be more accurate, right? Because you're really just being able to describe almost like your model's behavior or the loss surface of your, of your, of your, of your model you're trained on uh, just locally. Also ask for a more global understanding, which is typically and can be derived from like average or like ranked contributions of input variables um, for the given outputs of the model. And the point here is that you want to have some total understanding of your model as a whole, right? So um, they're oftentimes based on aggregates over, uh, over, over the local, local sampling. And then a lot of techniques you may come across, they could be either model specific or model agnostic, right? So model specific just means that it's a model, it's an explainability technique that was developed for a certain model type. So weights for linear models, or um, if you have tree-based ensemble models, there's techniques you can use just for those, directional feature contributions. Or you can think about explainability techniques that are model agnostic. So it doesn't really matter what the model uh, architecture is or the algorithm, um, things like permutation feature importance, or explainable surrogates. These are ways to approach explainability uh, that don't really care about the underlying uh, model architecture. Um, of course, a lot of times what it really comes down to is understanding the data type. So whether you have images, text, or tabular data, uh, and there are certain techniques that lend themselves well to either one of those. Here you can see how um, you can get explainability for images or text, or maybe even tabular data, giving you an idea of like which features uh, caused the model to make the prediction that it did. So just really just go a little bit quickly into like integrated gradients, which is a commonly used techniques. Suppose you have an image classification model and the image label that was, the label that was predicted for this image was firebug. You may say, okay, well, why? Like, why is this model predicting firebug? I mentioned integrated gradients before. The way that works is you choose a baseline. In this case, for an image, you're just taking a black image. You can see that there in the, the scaled images. And as you increase the intensity of each pixel, you can get to the, the, the image that uh, we, what we have under question. And we can monitor then our model's predictions as that gradient changes of our pixel values. And you can see on, in the curve on our, predi our prediction score, there's kind of like an, an aha moment. Eventually our model is saying it's not a, a, a fire boat, but then at some point it says, okay, I'm fairly confident that this is a fire boat. And you want to understand where that occurred. Uh, and by the technique of integrated gradients, you can actually highlight which pixels led to that, ballot, that, led to that prediction the most. And so you see, okay, here's our image. Here's our explanation. Uh, do we agree that that's a good reason for predicting uh, a fire boat? And yeah, that seems to make sense. A lot of, there's a lot of ways you can incorporate uh, explainability with Google Cloud Platform. It's, you know, it's pretty simple. You can, when you deploy your model, you can set it up to be able to provide uh, explanations with your predictions. And the way that works is you can pass uh, uh, an instance for a prediction and you can ask it, um, you can, you know, Ask, use AI platform explain so that when you get your prediction, you don't just get the, the prediction, but also you get, in this case, we're looking at these sample Shapley values for the attribution value for each of the features that came in from that, from that uh, instance you want to predict from. So I'll stop there so we have some time to answer questions, but this is a quick summary. Uh, you know, really what we're talking about are just design patterns that show up in machine learning. Try to focus on some that are more focused on the ML ops aspects, just because of the, the focus of the conference. Um, but we talked about two. We talked about uh, continuous model evaluation and, and uh, explainable predictions. And again, as a rehash, the model evaluation is just a way to understand when your model degrades, how your model performance is degrading over time, so that you can make some action to improve, improve performance. And then, of course, explainable predictions is then referring to uh, the ability and necessity to be able to explain why these uh, complex, but you know, powerful black box models are making predictions that they are. Um, and I'll stop there. This is, there's more patterns in the book. All the proceeds go to Girls Who Code. So if you're interested, please buy it. And let's answer some questions. Thank you so much, Mike. It was really an interesting presentation. Also, thank you so much for sharing the tricks uh, uh, for um, AI platform. I personally use GCP and AI platform, but I ah. didn't know it was like, like they explained. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, check it out. And then you can look at the code in the GitHub, and there'll be some examples of how you can use it there. So all the stuff I mentioned, the, the code-wise, there's a, if you look at the GitHub, you can see how it actually looks if you want to do it yourself. OK, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. So, so far, we have only one, one question. So please, people, don't be shy. Yeah. Start to some questions. 
and I'm gonna read the first one. Sure. So that that is actually a pretty good one. Why some of those models making wrong prediction for minority underrepresented group? Is it uh, that we don't have uh, the availability of data about minority group, etc.? How can we ensure fairness? Yeah, this is a really great question. <laughs> this is like, I think like a lot of I know us we were like worried a lot about this, but um, but so there's a lot we could say. I think that the simplest answer would be um, would be exactly this. Like you want to you know explainability and fairness. These are things that in my mind don't happen at the at the end, right? Like they should be part of the entire ML ML workflow, that entire cycle, like from from the data preparation and feature engineering. You know, this is this is like should be the ongoing conversation. You really have to work these in. But a lot of reasons why models can be are found to be you know you know not represent under you know minority groups well is that that those examples may not be existent in the training data, and that's and and again like everyone has some sort of bias like you you, you know people have biases and they unfortunately these biases can like leak into the model development process as well, and so one way to combat that is to really understand the data that you're training your model on. These models aren't magic, right? They're just a way of like finding patterns in the data that you provide. And so you call out a really important point here of like, you know, how do you ensure that minority underrepresented groups are represented fairly and with your model? And, and one thing you can do is make sure that that data exists in your, in your training data and also to be very aware of it, right? Like you want to test for this once you're, once you're in, in the development process of your model, you want to look for that. Um, there's, other, there's more sophisticated tools also. It's not a kind of thing where you, you know, there's things like the what if tool, there's TIF div, uh, TF diff or min diff rather in, in TensorFlow, where you can use to understand like how your models make performance on different uh, how it's performing on different groups. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of tools on ML fairness that are definitely that will definitely help that with that, uh, with that question. But it's it's an important one to keep in mind. Okay, we have another question, but it's more like a practical one. They are sure. asking if you can copy over uh, the link for the book uh, uh, into the chat. So I can. People the access. Thank you so much. Sure, the book, the design patterns book. Yeah, oh, somebody already did it. That. Thanks. Okay, okay, yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, so we do have another question, oh, other two coming. Okay, so the next one is, how do you usually join between prediction and label in real time? Do you create a hash from uh, uh, user ID, timestamp, model ID? Um, yeah, I think it, I think the difficulty is usually having the label like in real time because it's oftentimes like maybe I'm, I'm actually quite curious like what scenario you have in mind, but like typically you don't have the label in real time because if you if you had the had the label then you would probably just be providing that unless I'm misunderstanding. But it's like you know, the point is is like you usually need someone to go back through after the fact and, and maybe you have that in a very quick like tight feedback loop so you can do it with a very short amount of time. In which case, sure, like there's lots of tools you would use. Like you really want to, you really want to make sure that you understanding the features. So that would involve like the user ID, the timestamp, the model ID. But to get that label in real time is usually really hard or not possible. Like if you keep the label in real time, then you would be providing that. So so typically, what it is 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 more like um, being able to go back. You know, look like you're just capturing the request. Like all you really have time to do is capture the request. Uh, and then it may take some effort to go back and, and again, like it's a very manual process, but you want to be able to look at all those things and like look at the features and be able to have a person say, okay, yes, because I find more and more like data quality issues become a real problem in productionizing models and understand that, you know, and maintaining models, um, certainly in, 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 even in training models, but you're only going to introduce more noise if you don't have quality ground truth labels uh, when you're when you're doing it sort of the second order level of, of doing the, in the model evaluation. Okay, so we have, uh, I think the, the scenario that had in mind uh, was a buy and click. So oh, if, right. Yes, it is possible if it is a, like a buy and click scenario. Yeah, then for sure, like any, any kind of like features you'd be able to, like in that case, I'd probably hold it. Like I'd probably keep all that information and then you know, like you present something, and if there if, if if there's some user action that you can then keep, then I would definitely use some sort of like hash or some ID that I could then use to to write back into that table wherever I'm storing my wherever you're storing your uh, requests. 
Okay, cool. So Amit, if you have any other follow-up question, please post them in the chat. So yeah. meanwhile, we are gonna move to the next one. Okay, so do you have some strategies uh, you use to develop a user trust in a model when it takes a lot of time to get the ground truth level? You know, this is a good, this is a great question. It's nice, because I think everyone started thinking about the same thing. But like, you know, this kind of stuff, it comes up. Um, so in that, again, like in that section, we also talk about like um, stakeholder management and, and, and maybe, maybe your question is just sort of making me lean that direction, but this makes me think about like stakeholder management. Like when you're developing a model, how do you get trust along, along the way? And um, a lot of times it really helps by having like simple benchmarks. Like you, you, when you, before you even start development, you typically there's a conversation with the business to understand like what are the important eval metrics that you want to track. And so, you know, and, and I think it really helps to have a heuristic benchmark. Heuristic meaning easy to explain. Like one that's just like, it may just even use machine learning, but just a way of getting to a prediction. And this really helps in building trust for a model because if you can say, okay, look, if we use our, our existing business practices or if we use a, a practice that is like very understandable, like just taking an average or just, you know, really doesn't have to be machine learning then you get people to understand, okay, like this is how good we can get without this model. And then you can build trust by saying, okay, here's, here's what the machine learning model can do. Because so many times I've worked with, you know, working with stakeholders in the company and they're really hesitant to just pull the trigger and say, okay, yeah, let's, let's move everything over to using this machine learning, this, this model that was developed under these guys, under these practices that I'm not very familiar with myself. So sometimes it really helps just to start that conversation, you know, early and understand what your eval metrics are and then show your performance either on a test set or again, like finding ways where you can um, recreate that idea of that continuous evaluation by looking at older data and being like, look, if we had had this model last quarter, we would have been able to say this, which we saw, you know, and then providing um, some offline, offline comparison. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so next question, it's a technical one. So I love using Sharp. Uh, the Python library. Do you have a, a good resource for people with limited advanced math game theory knowledge to get a through deeper understanding of uh, its values? Any other shop package uh, you recommend for non-cloud users due to work limitation on perm? Yeah, for sure. That's that, that's a really good point. Yeah, like um, I mentioned the cloud, that sort of makes it very easy, but a lot of times you're, people are like, you're, you're, you're cooking these things up yourself. I, I will say like there's a, the way I've learned a lot of these things is just from like, um, you know, Googling and like looking at blogs or, or various articles. There is one book that I think is worth mentioning. There's a book that comes to mind. It's called Interpretable um, Machine Learning by Christopher Molnar, M-O-L-N-A-R. Anyway, he has a really, <laughs> I mean, it's a great book in general, but there's a really nice section on shaft values and he like draws it out with pictures and everything. And like, I don't know. Um, I really like that. When I teach this to students in my role at Google, where I'm teaching this stuff, uh, I'll often like you know reference that because it's a really good, it's a really good breakdown of like how the shaft values actually work because it does rely on a lot of game theory, right? Like you're doing, you know, there's some very sophisticated game theory that's taking place, and um, in my mind, like things click for me. I'll read the theory, but it really clicks when I see like a you know example, like just one simple example, three features. You're predicting the price of an apartment, for example. Like, what, how do these features affect the, the value of your model's prediction of it? So, um, I'll check it out. That's exactly it. Yeah, I think that book's great. Like, it's really good. I mean, here's a section on Shappy, probably worth reading. Yeah, no worries. Okay, cool. So, we don't have any other questions. Let's give maybe like a minute. So, to... oh, sure. we just got another question. So, you showed an example displaying. Uh, Shapley values to add context to, to model prediction. Thinking of uh, augmenting human decision making process, what other strategies do you apply to help non technical stakeholders understand machine learning outputs? Yeah, what other strategies do you apply to help them? So, this might let me know if I can add more clarification, but the first thing that comes to mind, it was, it's kind of similar. I'll just say a little more about what I was saying before. Like when we work with, sometimes we work, we work closely with technical teams on the customer side, but oftentimes we'll, the first kickoffs will be with the non-technical folks, right? Like, and so having, um, you know, the non-technical stakeholders is, is a real issue. And 
And I find what helps the best is this heuristic, like I, again, like as a, as a practitioner in general, or as an engineer in general, you know, it's really valuable to develop, you should build, develop a benchmark right away. Like that should be your first step is what's your, what's your rough crude benchmark to start. And that's for you to be like, okay, like not only am I doing better, but, but also you're also asking yourself, like, is all this extra work time, energy effort worth what I could be doing otherwise? Like, again, like building a model is not just building a model, but then productionizing and deploying it. It's like, you know, are we, are we really moving the needle in a meaningful way? So it's good to know. But really, that the idea of it being a heuristic is super helpful for non-technical people. I find like if it really doesn't use machine learning at all, and you connect with their on their gut level with what they would expect or what they understand, that really requires like meeting people where they are. Then I find that super super helpful. Like, um, and again, like I, we I can get really technically deep if people want to get into it. But a lot of times with this non-technical stakeholders, they don't they don't really care. They want to. They, they've gotten to a place where. It's not benefited by knowing the why of like the intricacies of some model. So there, the more heuristic your explanations can be, and the more heuristic your like, you know, your comparisons can be. I think I think the better. So um, that's that's sort of my very vague advice is just like connect with people where they are, like with what they know, like you meet them there and, and try to like you you do, do the comparison that way. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we do have another question. It's related to one of the example you showed us uh, into the presentation, and it asks uh, how do you uh, how do we read the confidence score, especially the higher values like around 0.75. Fair to say, maybe it means 0.75 for choice one versus, for example, zeros. 0.15 for choice two and 0.1 for choice three yeah that's great so you know in the example that i had there i didn't say much about the actual like model and what the final layers were this makes me think of maybe again like realign me if this is not what you had in mind as your question but um but like the way that model was trained is like it was like a final softmax layer and again like you can look at the actual code on github so you can really see like how that model you know, build the header models built in TensorFlow. But in that case, yeah, the, the, you know, we also talk in the book about like um, multi-label problems where where you you want to be able to have more than one label. In that case, I, you wouldn't want to use a softmax. So you want to be able to provide like the confidence for each individual possible label. But because here my labels were mutually distinct, for that example that I was doing on the slides, it's like either it's New York Times or it's TechCrunch or it's GitHub and there's no in between. Like it can't be, it couldn't have, it wouldn't have been published in both. So, um, so yeah, the, there the confidence score would have been like 0 0.75, 0 0.15, and 0 0.1. Yeah, it's just because it needs to be split um, on that. Sorry, on those final predictions. Um, and I think it's important to keep that. Like we didn't see a use for it in the slides that I presented, but it is a confidence score, right? So you know, you want to under. There's more sophisticated ways you can use that data. So if I was building up this from scratch, you know, this evaluation pipeline, then I would. You kind of want to keep everything you think you might uh, you might want to want to use. So um, I think it's important to have that as well. So yeah, okay, cool. Okay, thank you so much. So any other question? Last chance. <laughs> Otherwise, we are going to close here the talk. Let's give a few seconds. Maybe a last one. Yeah. Thanks everybody for the questions and the attention and. Um, Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, David. And thanks, everyone. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay. So it seems that there are no other questions. So I want to thank you, Mike. It was really an interesting presentation okay. and really good job with your book. Good. And thank you very much for being here today. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity. This is great. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye, everyone.